got to the hospital, they started me on an insulin drip and I began feeling better within hours. I had to stay the first night in the ER waiting for a bed upstairs, but I finally did get one. I had all the classic signs of DKA. When my blood sugar was going up, I was extremely thirsty and putting out a very high urine output. I went to bed like this, thinking that the insulin would kick in overnight, but my tubing was kinked and I was getting no insulin whatsoever. I woke up the next morning very nauseous and still very thirsty, but when I tried to drink anything, I began throwing up. And I just fell in love with a gangster, so I hold him down like an anchor. He said if I keep it a hundred, that he keep me safe like a banker. Now From there, things just got worse. I started having abdominal pain, which is weird because that is below the level of my injury and I can't feel my stomach. I knew it was time to call 911, though, when I began having Kussmaul breathing, a form of hyperventilation. This is a big red flag and indicative of DKA. It is characterized by deep, rapid, and labored breathing. I could not catch my breath or talk in full sentences. It was terrifying. I'm so glad I'm feeling better now. No more beeping ER sounds, and I was able to get a good night's sleep. If you've ever wondered what happens to somebody with type 1 diabetes when they don't have insulin for, let's just say an hour and a half, this is what happens. Keep in mind when I'm getting the amount of insulin as I need, I'm going to stay between 80 and 160. I am currently 346 continuing to rise. That is because at 2.45 p.m. I needed to change my pump site. This is what goes on my body through a little cannula and gives me my insulin. And as you can see, I was really steady and then all of a sudden sharp rise, I didn't eat anything. And so therefore it's telling me my pump site is bad. The message here for non-type ones is be grateful that your body just automatically does this behind the scenes for you, keeps you alive every day. You don't even know it, but it's happening behind the scenes. And then for type ones, the message is know that diabetes is 80% fine tuning, 20% acceptance, because sometimes diabetes is just gonna diabetes and then you gotta roll with it. They said if I did coke, I could party all night. They lied. Find out the truth about cocaine. When I hear a trans person compare hormones to life-saving medicine, I can't help but think that they must have no real problems in their lives. At the very least, they must not have experience with a chronic illness. I am a type 1 diabetic. I was diagnosed at age 3, and so for all intents and purposes, I've been disabled my entire life. Insulin is a life-saving hormone. HRT is not. Really I don't cute. watch TV. Like, no one cares. You don't get an award because you watch less TV. I can't remember living without diabetes. Type 1 diabetes, also known as juvenile diabetes, is a hereditary disease wherein the pancreas stops producing insulin. Insulin is needed to move glucose from the bloodstream and into the cells in order to make energy. In order to stay alive, I have to take external insulin multiple times a day. Insulin can be delivered through needles and vials, insulin pens, which allow you to turn a dial to determine dosage, or through insulin pumps, which are automated insulin delivery systems. Insulin vials and pens are of a similar price. In the United States, a month's supply without insurance is about $600. Typically, unless on an insulin pump, you'll need two types of insulin, short-acting and long-acting. Long-acting is for ensuring stability, as even without eating, blood sugars can often rise over time, while short-acting is to fix high blood sugars or take them with food. Insulin pumps add an additional cost for the technology. The actual controller is one at time purchase, but the part which attaches to the body for insulin delivery must be replaced between every three to seven days. Insulin pumps vary in cost depending on the model. Some have tubes and are connected to the controller, while others are separate and directly placed on the body. Prices out of pocket range from $500 to $800 a month. In order to determine blood sugar, we use glucose monitors. The old-fashioned way is to prick a finger and then place the blood on the test strip, which is read by a glucose monitor to determine how much sugar is in the blood. The ideal level is about 120. 
Continuous glucose monitors do exactly what the title sounds like and monitor blood sugar at all times, making it easier to determine when to take insulin and how activities like exercise affect blood sugar. Test strips can range from $19 if you buy an off-brand to $50 a bottle. Continuous glucose monitors range from $70 to $150 a month and essentially check your blood sugar all the time. So let's tally that up. If you were living without insurance, as I am, in order to access life-saving care in the United States, you would pay $1,200 a month for insulin, $100 for test strips, and perhaps another 100 or so for needle caps, alcohol swabs, and other activities. So $1,400 minimum for only the basic insulin, test strips, and related items. So the price of diabetes supplies is absurdly high. We are all aware of that. And this was really eye-opening and really put things into perspective. So I went through and listed off all the supplies that I currently use and found the retail price for all of these supplies. And I split it up between with and without technology because technically you don't need to use the technology to manage your diabetes and not everybody is able to access and afford the technology. All right, everybody buckle up. This is gonna be a wild ride. Starting off strong, we have two glucometers. One is a backup. You never know what's gonna to happen to your glucometer. I had one ran over in college before. Rest in peace. Then we have test strips, $2,400 a year, short-acting insulin, $6,360 a year, long-acting insulin, $4,284 a year, glucagon, $300, alcohol pads, $60, lancets, $360, syringes slash pen needles, $648, lancing devices, $24, um, Control solution, $20, ketone strips, $10, and glucose tabs, $5, to a total for the year of $14,521. And that's just supplies, not even any medical appointments or procedures, blood work, any of that. And then on top of that, to add technology to the mix, there's Dexcom sensors for $4,800 a year, Dexcom transmitters for $1,200 a year, Omnipods for $7,200 a year, and a PDM for your Omnipod is about $400. So this is why having insurance is pretty much a necessity as a type one diabetic. And losing my insurance is definitely the top of my fear list. That's for sure. And the difference in quality of care between just insulin and the modern innovations like insulin pumps and CGMs is immense. If you are not diabetic, you probably just eat your food and go. You don't have to remember the carbohydrates in every item you eat, remember the math to determine dosage, or deal with unexpected changes, be it hypoglycemia, known as low blood sugars, or hyperglycemia, known as high blood sugars. A low blood sugar for a diabetic is not the same as you not eating for a bit and feeling a little bit hungry. It comes with mood changes, shakiness, difficulty thinking, and of course, risk of coma if not treated before it drops too low. The same goes for high blood sugar, except with nausea, excessive urination, and thirst, recurring infections, and of course, DKA, which we will discuss later. If you have high blood sugars often over a long period of time, you risk complications like damage to blood vessels, leading to high risk of heart attack, damage to your eyes, feet, skin, teeth, immune systems, kidneys, and liver. Symptoms of very high blood sugar. Very high blood sugar can cause a condition called DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis, means your blood sugar is too acidotic and it can be life-threatening. Symptoms of very high blood sugar, such as very thirsty, frequent urination, and also fast breathing is something that you need to be alert. Or having dry skin and even having fruity breath or sweet smelling breath is something that you need to be aware of. Some people might even having nausea, vomiting, stomach ache, and even having confusion or headache. So you need to bring them to see a doctor immediately. Now, let's say you want HRT. HRT is used to induce the secondary sex characteristics of the opposite sex. In essence, it is a cosmetic drug which induces many negative side effects. However, it is often portrayed as being life-saving, as not affirming a trans-identified person's identity is argued to lead to suicidal tendencies. Oh yay, another random white guy coming into my comments to flagrantly display their ignorance and bigotry. <laughs> Delightful. Gender-affirming care saves children's lives. 
Suicide contagion is the process where one suicide contributes to the risk of suicide or suicidal behaviors by others, particularly for those who may already be at risk. Suicide contagion is associated with some of our behaviors on social media. For example, it's recommended that we avoid repeating the story over and over and stick to very factual, concise information. It's also recommended that we avoid talking about the manner of death to avoid duplication. It's important to remember not to glamorize or glorify the person who died or to offer oversimplified answers for the reason for suicide. As being trans is not a choice. Let's debunk common transphobic myths. Sorry if I sound or look weird, I'm a little bit sick. First, we're gonna cover why you don't have to have dysphoria to be trans. Being trans shouldn't be determined by the level of dysphoria, but rather euphoria. In other words, it should be determined by the level of comfort and love you feel in your new gender expression. Not how insecure we are about our body and mannerisms. There are so many reasons someone may not have dysphoria, but I'll cover three. This being your environment, finding accommodations, and lack of it being triggered. Someone who grew up without gender roles being enforced may not have dysphoria due to a lack of a comparison. For example, let's say a trans man was taught that men with bigger chests were still masculine as a kid. So if he ends up having a larger chest in the future, he may not have dysphoria due to that line of thinking being installed when he was younger. You can also not have dysphoria because you're happy with the stage of transition you're at, which could be after surgery, hormones, or even just cutting or growing out your hair. Whichever stage eliminates your dysphoria. And last, if you're around someone who is accepting, you may not feel dysphoria because that person isn't triggering it. And this goes with anything. As long as it's not being triggered, you won't have it. Many say being trans is like wearing your left shoe on your right foot and your right shoe on your left foot. It's super uncomfortable and you can't do anything to your best abilities with those shoes. You may sit down and forget about it for a moment, but as soon as you start walking, you remember that uncomfortable feeling. Reference to it being triggered. But luckily, there are ways you can get your shoes changed. Referencing hormone surgery or whatever stage makes you feel comfortable. Some may have shoes that don't actually hurt. But getting them changed is still more comfortable and they can still perform activities to their best ability. Unlike they could with their first shoes. Which is reference to not having dysphoria at all. These people are born this way. Considering, I don't like to assume, but I can... <laughs> happily assume that you're a part of the party that wants to save kids, considering that we know from all the studies and statistics done on gender affirming care that it does save children's lives, it's really weird that those same people are so against it. This may upset some of you, but there are more and more studies coming out that prove puberty blockers are not in fact reversible. Obviously, some people are thinking this is a great way to cope with kids having anxiety going through puberty and being uncomfortable in their bodies. Um, but the reality is that puberty blockers suppress estrogen and testosterone, which are hormones that help develop the reproductive system, but also affect the bones, the brain, and other parts of the body. Some doctors are claiming that children will simply snap back and regain their bone strength once they stop the blockers, um, but evidence is suggesting that many do not fully rebound and lag behind their peers. Unfortunately, this is something a lot of people are going to have to learn the hard way. The professionals don't know everything. Sometimes they're misinformed. There's such a thing as malpractice. They misdiagnose. It happens. Teaching kids to cope with their own discomfort in their bodies by changing everything is not healthy. This is chemical castration. It's a crime. This is the lobotomy of our generation. Because if you're the type of person that would rather have a dead son than a trans daughter, you're part of the problem. The cost, accordingly, is very low. On average, hormone replacement therapy for gender affirmation can cost anywhere from $30 to $100 a month for individuals without health insurance. The World Professional Association for Transgender Health also suggests that you receive a formal consultation with a mental health professional, which can cost anywhere between $75 to $200 without insurance. So on the low end, you can get hormone therapy for $105. If you're pretty, stop. If you want to transition, stop. Just listen to me. I don't care what anybody ever tells you. Transitioning is not that expensive. You can do it the right way. And I do mean the right way. How? Well, it's kind of simple. Do a little research. Now, minus the fact that some people can't actually transition due to health concerns, does not invalidate that they are still not male. Now, here's how I did it. I went and talked to Planned Parenthood. I don't have health insurance. I told them I don't have health insurance. I said, that's okay, we'll put you on a sliding scale. This appointment's only gonna cost you 40 bucks. Wait, what, 40 bucks? Are you kidding me? That's great. So then, now I got prescribed tea. 
I started tea today for the first time. It cost me less than $100 to start tea, including needles and the testosterone. The pharmacy even helped me out by giving me a discount on my tea, as well as the needles. They do everything they can to help you. You gotta ask. So when you're ready, ask questions, get help. Now, what happens if you don't have access to these life-saving hormones? Well, as a diabetic, I would have from three to four days to possibly a week to live. What happens without insulin is severe high blood sugars, which quickly turns into diabetic ketoacidosis, or DKA. DKA occurs when there is not enough insulin in the body to allow for access to enough sugar to function properly. So your liver begins to turn some of the body fat into acids called ketones. These build up in the bloodstream and spill over into the urine. When these excess ketones get into the blood, the blood becomes acidic, causing DKA, which is a combination of very high blood sugar, dehydration and shock, and exhaustion. Yes, that could actually happen. What this person is referring to is something called diabetic ketoacidosis, which is actually a medical emergency. That is because your body is literally acidic. And the reason for that is that insulin is a primary driver of your glucose going into your cells for energy. But what happens is those patients who have type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes, they have a lack of insulin, whether it's a lack of insulin production, which is in type 1 diabetes, or a resistance in insulin, which is type 2 diabetes. And because of that, they're not able to use insulin for energy because the glucose is not being driven into the cell and go through glycolysis for energy. What happens then is that the liver then breaks down fat and the fat then turns into ketones. Ketones are acid molecules that make your blood acidic and that could cause you to have a cardiac arrest. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people with diabetic ketoacidosis who end up passing away. And the reason for that is that oftentimes they don't even recognize that they have diabetes. They might have had fatigue, increased level of thirst, increased urination, weight gain or weight loss, and they might not have even gotten checked. And because of that, they kept eating the same amounts of food, high sugar foods, and all of a sudden, whether it was an infection or increased amount of carbohydrates or sugar, drove them into diabetic ketoacidosis. So again, it's important that you make sure that if you have any of those symptoms that I mentioned, please see your primary care doctor for a hemoglobin A1C, which is a test that could diagnose or exclude diabetes. There is no surviving a lack of insulin. This is one of the reasons why you'll see so many headlines about diabetics rationing their insulin and dying, or dying after aging out of their parents' insurance. And while there are some solutions to the issues in accessing insulin, such as mutual aid, manufacturer's assistance programs, or the lower cost at Walmart insulins, these often take time to access or are only available for a short time. And to be quite honest, Walmart insulin is not a solution. It's a stopgap and one which is very frustrating to hear non-diabetics constantly suggest as a solution. It's not surprising I get a comment like this. It's really common when I talk about insulin pricing. So I wanna talk about Walmart insulin and why many people can't use it and why it's not a solution to the insulin price crisis. The brand Relyon, which is available at Walmart, makes um, N and R insulin available over the counter for a really low price, like 25 to $35. The Walmart insulin argument is like really common when we talk about the insulin price crisis in the U.S. However, the formula with the Walmart insulin is different than the really expensive analog insulins that most people use today. It's actually so dangerous it's been known to cause this dead in bed syndrome in people with diabetes. Diabetics shouldn't be forced to use an outdated and dangerous drug just because they can't afford the analog insulin. With oversight from a physician, Walmart insulin can be used in really dire circumstances but it's not a solution to the insulin price crisis. Nor did the Inflation Reduction Act help, as it only capped the monthly out-of-pocket cost for insulin at $35 for seniors on Medicare. This does not help the uninsured, or those on private insurance, or anyone under 65. It hardly helps anyone at all. Now, compare this to what happens when you don't get HRT. Nothing. No health defects occur. You will not die of bodily dysfunctions. All that will happen is that you get sad because you didn't get your way. Some do threaten that not having HRT will cause them to commit suicide, but that's no different than an ex-boyfriend threatening to hurt himself if you leave him. Threatening suicide to get your way is manipulative and illustrates that HRT is not a requirement to life. It is not a life-saving medicine. 
It is a choice and one centered on a belief that cross-sex hormones will solve comorbid conditions like depression, anxiety, and PTSD without ever exploring how gender dysphoria may be tied to those illnesses. So let me just say, as someone with a chronic illness, as someone who will die if I do not get my insulin, who cannot afford insulin now as I'm not insured and insulin in the U.S. is extremely expensive, you're fine. This is not life-saving medicine. You are just a brat who doesn't who complains and cries and threatens when you don't get your way. If I don't get insulin, I die. If you don't get your hormones, you cry. These are not the same thing. This, dear viewers, is where we part. This topic is one that obviously I have great feelings about because as I've mentioned before, I've had diabetes for 20 fucking years and I got kicked off of Medicaid um, and now I have difficulty finding insulin, and it's one of the reasons why I try to live out the country as much as possible, because even without a prescription, I can generally just go to a pharmacy and say, I need insulin, and they give it to me, and it costs maybe 60 bucks for a month's supply, and that's without a prescription. And yet here, hormones, which are completely up to you, you don't need them, you don't need them, they're completely voluntary, and they have negative side effects. Nope, you don't need to have anything specific. You can get a quick doctor's visit, fill sign off on it, and boom, here's your hormones. Go wild. It annoys me so much that hormones are called life-saving medicine when they're not. They aren't. If you ever had your life threatened by a health problem, you would understand that they're not a life-saving medicine. Anyhow, if you guys have any comments, questions, or concerns, let me know in the comment section down below. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye.